And over the people who remained in the land of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon had left, he appointed Gedaliah, the son of Ahiakim, son of Shaphan, governor. Now when all the captains and their men heard that the king of Babylon had appointed him as governor, they came with their men to Gedaliah at Mitzpah, namely Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and Jehanan, the son of Korea, and Sariah, the son of I'm tired of saying these names. And Gedaliah swore to them and their men, saying, Do not be afraid because of the Chaldean officials. Live in the land and serve the king of Babylon, and it will be well with you. But in the seventh month, Ishmael and all the other people, the royal family, came with ten men, struck him down, and put him to death, along with the Jews and the Chaldeans who were with him at Mitzvah. Then all the people, both small and great, and the captains of the forces arose and went to Egypt, for they were afraid of the Chaldeans. And in the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 27th day of the month, evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, graciously freed the king of Judah from prison. He spoke kindly to him and gave him a seat above the seats of the kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiakim put off his prison garments, and every day of his life he dined regularly at the king's table. And for his allowance, a regular allowance was given him by the king according to his daily needs as long as he lived. Now, go over real quick to Jeremiah 29. Now, here Jeremiah is telling them, settle in. Y'all are going to be there 70 years. So you need to build houses. You need to settle in. You need to um, just serve the king. And uh, this is where he said uh, in verse 10, we'll start there in, in Jeremiah uh, 29. This is a letter. It's not in your notes. This is a letter that uh, Jeremiah wrote to the exiles. Uh, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Now, Isaiah said the same thing. He said, can a nation be reborn in a day? Yes. Now, this is speaking of Daniel's work. So Daniel, um, obviously an intercessor, um, began to pray for his nation when he came across a prophetic word that they would be in exile for 70 years. His prayers kick-started the movement that would then result in Cyrus sending them back to rebuild their land, right? President Trump was recognized as a Cyrus by Israel. He should have been recognized as a Cyrus by us. We didn't hear and heed the message of grace the first term. Now, we're having to have a little bit of some judgment here during this fake presidency. Okay, so he's warning us. He's trying to get us to listen. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the, the people of God. He ain't talking to the world. He's trying to get our attention. If you're going to have a nation, you better wake up. Because there's going to come a point where there will be no nation. Will we have this promise that he'll put America back together? I don't know. I do know People can say, well, you're not Israel. America's not Israel. No. But the very first pilgrims that set their foot on the shores of this country made a covenant with God. He honors His covenant even when we don't. Right? So we invited Him into this country as a light on a hill. You cannot have a country with our constitution without morality. It will not work. So our job is to restore morality in this country. And that begins with the people of God. You got half the people that say they're Christian 
that believe in abortion. Did y'all know that? I heard of something very interesting about that uh, recently. You know, we hear this, my body, my choice. And they said, but what you find is that baby has a completely different DNA than the mom. Yep. So if it's her body, it would have the same DNA. Yeah. But it doesn't. It's not her body. So it's not her no. body. Mm -hmm. And you know, this is the deal where science, they always say, follow the science, follow the science, follow the science. Let's follow the science. Which that played a role in their decision. That's right. Because they said back then we didn't have the technology right. that we have now. They have clearly verified that that baby is a human in the womb and has all the rights that any citizen has in this country. Now, of course, they gave it back to the states because the right to kill your own child is not enumerated in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely right. We have a big job. And to me, this is the saddest thing, and we have to be careful that we don't because there's two stories here. There are stories of the people of God not listening to the prophets, but there's also the story of a nationalistic fervor that refused to also hear the prophets and got themselves in trouble. And they could have been disciplined within the context of their own land, but instead they wouldn't listen to what the prophet was saying, which all that he said had come to pass. Therefore, everything was wiped out. Everything. So we've got to make sure that our patriotism doesn't trump voice doesn't trump uh, presence. So this didn't have to happen. Their leaders didn't have to be killed. Their nation didn't have to be completely wiped off. Their army didn't have to be decimated. The once great nation was gone and it did not need to happen. God is faithful even when we are not. So now, before we kill the um, camera, I want to go into the prophetic word I'm going to read the former one, and again, I'm going to keep the source anonymous. Okay, so this was a word given, um, now I updated it in June, so I think it was at the beginning of this year. I'll read it in its entirety, and then I'll give you the second part. Okay, so, um, and I can share this with you guys. I might have already, I'm not sure, but to make rash, hasty decisions shows that you are not trusting the Lord, but when you rely totally on God, you will act carefully and prudently. And I'm going to need to borrow someone's passion translation if you have it. Thank you. When wicked leaders rise to power, good people go into hiding. But when they fall from power, the godly take their place. There is going to be a great sifting. Wickedness is coming to full display. I saw a stage like from an old theater with huge red curtains and an opening into the darkness of backstage. The spotlight was center stage, and out of the deep black darkness came a large, hairy monster. Long brown hair all over his body, a curved posture, and large, clawed hands. He came willingly but reluctantly onto center stage into the spotlight for all the audience to see. The Lord is saying, we haven't seen anything yet. The prayers to expose and shed light on what is in the darkness have not exposed anything yet. The things perceived as, quote, revealed by God are simply the monster's mistakes. But when I reveal him, it will be a full show with a packed house. I will bring him to the light, bring to the light everything. Dealings in secret back rooms, undisclosed transactions, plans to pull the wool over the eyes on the righteous will be illuminated. Public health, financial institutions, the IRS, military, it will all be out in the open. It is up to my people to continue praying for these things to be illuminated as they have been, but to add, how do we deal with it when it comes out? Okay? You will know it's the Lord's doing, not from the shaking, but from His illuminating where there is no way for reasonable people to justify what was done. And this is key. When the levy breaks, you have to have a direction. The godly have to be prepared in order to fill the vacancy left from the revealing of wickedness. Prepare in hiding to be proven for when the wicked are removed. I saw Joe Biden wandering around the Oval Office. The room was bright 
As he wandered, there was a dark silhouette constantly behind him. The silhouette was so dark, it absorbed the light, and he didn't know it was there. I felt the Lord saying if he knew it was there, he wouldn't allow it to stay. In the vision, he's wandering around not because of dementia, but because he has no idea to what to do in his position of authority. He's like a tourist, not a president. A president wouldn't be walking around. He would be at the desk. The spirit is taking advantage of him. Okay? Now, I do think he has dementia, but the wandering around is not due to, to that. Okay, so any questions on that so far? Okay. Now, we're going to read Proverbs uh, 1, 20 through uh, 33. It's one of the scariest, actually, um, of mine. And it has to do with the goodness of God that I've studied as well so far. Okay, so here's the additional information that I got yesterday, which was 624. No, 625. Let me put the correct date in there. Um, now, no, he got this on 624. My concern is that he got this word in spite of Roe versus Wade, Wade being overturned. When was the what date? The twenty fourth. Okay. So, and you'll understand what I mean. So this word is tied to the first one. Okay. So in real life, this individual was in D.C. and saw a church. It's called National City Christian Church. And they have like the, it's like a, it looks like a government building. Like it's an old government institution that was taken over to be a church. It has like the Corinthian pillars. And it had the progress flag uh, flowing. And it had the um, pride, LGB to uh, community banners flowing. And uh, he, you know, he noticed that and thought, man, that pretty much sucks. Well, then he saw it not, it's in a vision. So he sees the same church in a vision, and he said it was completely decimated. All that remained was the front with the pillars, but it had been, you know, basically just destroyed. And he said there was like a, um, a cloudiness over it, like a darkness over it, and like vines growing up in it, like you would see like in scary movies and things like that. And uh, and that church still exists. So then it shifts to another vision. So he sees that church, it shifts to this vision where he was on the levee. Okay, so in reference, when the levee breaks, you have to have a direction. Okay, so now he's on the same levee and he saw there was a crack. So he bent down to touch it and it exploded. The whole levee exploded and he was out in the middle of an ocean and he started swimming and nothing there was no land there was nothing it was just water over all of the earth and he was like what do I do now where do I go because he's, he's bobbing and, uh, it, and he said everything was sudden it's like he goes to touch BAM he's in the water he goes to do this BAM you know, like if he said everything was like normal and then suddenly it was not. He said the ocean was super still and the sun was setting in the northeast. As he was floating, he saw golden ships that they looked like the pirates of the Caribbean ships, like British uh, ships. Uh, they were very far away though. And he's looking at one and then suddenly... A giant cord comes out, like tentacles, comes out from the ship, snatches him and pulls him so fast that he couldn't do anything, and he gets put in the ship. So it's like, bam, he's snatched out of the ocean. He gets on the ship, there's no one else, there's no crew, there's no other people, and he starts looking at the, the material of the ship. He said it was made of wood and gold, but it was alive. The ship was alive. The wood was alive. He sees other ships around it with these big cords plucking other people out like he was plucked, placing them on the ships. And that was the end of the vision. So he asked the Holy Spirit, what does this mean? 
because he he said you know they obviously they were separate but I don't think they are um, because the first vision will set the context for the next okay so that and I forgot to tell him that yesterday but so the first part is with the church judgment mm -hmm. begins with the church but the church here is institutional Christianity okay government institution that became a church right <coughs> the church closing its doors and the earth is overtaking its shell a gray cloud is dropping its gray shadow over big beautiful buildings this is the first of the sifting this church in particular has two stained glass windows of Garfield and Johnson, President Garfield and Johnson, and it's located at the city gate for all to see in Thomas Square of Washington, D.C. He said, uh, the, God told this individual, my comfort is ending. Those who have been in darkness in, in the church will not know me. I will no longer be whispering to them. They have made themselves a part of the institution and that will be their inheritance. Now, that scares us the most. This is after Roe versus Wade, guys. We're, there's danger here. Okay? So, before. huh? Before? On the same day. Yeah, so it got reversed and then he has these visions. Which, that surprised him too because he's like, I figured he we'd be celebrating and instead the Lord's like uh-uh no don't don't take this as a sign that things are going to be okay now what kind of sparked this is I got agitated I'm not going to name them I might in the future I haven't decided yet <laughs> but there's a couple that say they're Christian yet fully support LGBTQ Okay, they, they do the stupid ally Facebook post and they have the stupid rainbow that doesn't belong to that movement every Pride Month. First of all, I'm going to go on a little rant. Pride Month should be the clue. Okay? Uh, it's perverse. Love the sinner. The sin is absolutely perverse. And so you've got people that profess Jesus Christ. Okay. So I was already irritated about that. I find out they have a, a, a child that is gay or something. Which I told Ken, I said, if you ever turn out gay, just know I will love you, but I will never, ever, ever come into agreement with that, ever. Mm -hmm. So how our relationship proceeds, you know, would be interesting. He's like, Mom, I don't want to be gay. <laughs> but, you know, I was just like <laughs> warning him. So anyway, so I'm like, okay. I guess, you know, if you want to be dumb and think that that's God's will. Uh, then, Roe versus Wade gets overturned. And one of the individuals posts Ruth Gator Bader Ginsburg on her story. Mm -hmm. What's that supposed to mean? That you believe as a person who professes Jesus Christ in killing babies in the womb? Now I question whether you're even born again. Because you cannot have the Spirit of God and think that it's okay to rip babies apart in the womb, to literally drill in their brains and suck them out before you pull them, rip them from their mother's womb. The safest place that a baby should be able to live, right? So I'm irritated, and Kent knows these people. So I text him, and that's when I posted, you know, some things on that. I had to look up fancy words and stuff. But anyway, so a friend goes to, um, I think it was like, I don't know, I couldn't hear uh, the individual, but like a vacation Bible school to volunteer or something. And they're excited. Roe versus Wade has been, you know, overturned and they're talking about their excitement and a lady goes, oh no, it's terrible, they took away women's rights. Yeah. Another Christian. This is what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna comfort you anymore because you've not had my side. You've not been an advocate for the defenseless and for the poor. You've not helped people that are in the bondage of homosexuality and lesbianism. Instead, you have embraced things that I find repulsive. Not only that, but gossip and sowing strife among brethren is also repulsive. It's repulsive that 80 to 90% of people in churches are addicted to pornography. Mm -hmm. It's repulsive that over 50% of people in churches have been divorced. Is divorce always bad? No, I'm not saying that. I know lots of people that need to divorce the people they're married to because they were idiots. 
Not saying that, but where you can just so easily do away with people, cut them out, right? My sister's been divorced. She needed to. I'm sure you, you know, I'm not going to say your name. <laughs> you had to. We understand. But there is a problem in the church when things are done that God hates so easily, right? So we've got all of these things, not to mention the money, not to mention how money is handled in the church and the greed and the adultery and the child molestation and the child trafficking. This is all in the church. Okay? Now, Proverbs 1, 20 through 33 in the Passion. Wisdom's praises are sung in the streets and celebrated far and wide. Yet wisdom's songs, song is not always heard in the halls of higher learning, but in the hustle and the bustle of everyday life. Its lyrics can be heard above the din of the crowd. You will hear wisdom's warning as she preaches courageously to those who stop to listen. Foolish ones, how, long, how much longer will you cling to your deception? How much longer will you mock wisdom, cynical scorners who fight the facts? Come back to your senses and be restored to reality. Don't even think about refusing my rebuke. Don't you know that I'm ready to pour out my spirit of wisdom upon you and bring to you the revelation of my words that will make your heart wise? I've called to you over and over, still you refuse to come to me. I've pleaded with you again and again, yet you've turned a deaf ear to my voice. Now, Kent said... Uh, when we were talking about this the other day, that this right here is an answer to calamity. And I told him, I said, the thing that's interesting about uh, studying the book of Proverbs, the answer to calamity is to have wisdom so you never are in it. Or if you are, you get rescued out. So this psalm, or this Proverbs, goes directly with the vision the individual had, okay? Because wisdom is the answer to calamity. So then, listen to this. Because you've laughed at my counsel and have insisted on continuing in your stubbornness, I will laugh when your calamity comes and will turn away from you at the time of your disaster. Make a joke of my, my advice, will you? I'll make a joke out of you. When the storm clouds of terror gather over your head, when dread and distress consume you and your catastrophe comes like a hurricane, you will cry out to me, but I'm not going to answer then it will be too late to expect my help. When desperation drives you to search for me, I will be nowhere to be found. Because you have turned up your nose at me and closed your eyes to the fact and refused to worship me in awe, because you've scoffed at my wise counsel and laughed at my cor correction, now you will eat the bitter fruit of your own ways. You've made your bed, now lie in it. How do you like that? So, wisdom is what gets you on the ship. And there's going to be people that are going to be pulled out of the water that will be the leaders to guide the ships. The reason there was no crew or no people is because we're not yet in that time. He said, we've not seen anything yet. So this is the second part. The levee is about to break. A sudden ocean will engulf the entire earth. The righteous will find themselves in the depths. Do not stay in the water. The shaking is still not happened. You will not want to be in the water once the waves begin. He thinks the ships are revolution. Ships of revolution will keep you out of the depth. Those who escape the waves and enter the ships will captain the ships. Prepare to be leaders at this time. The curtains were read previously in the monster vision and the accents on the ships were the same color red. Old time stage, ships old time, ships were good. The Lord's way to get people where they need to be. This individual thinks that ocean is calamity all over the world. So all that to say that we have a big job. Um, but what disturbed both me and the, the person was they wanted institutional Christianity and that's their inheritance. That's what disturbs me the most. So I was reading this morning, and I know we're going a little bit, well actually we're right on time, I shortened. Um, 
the worship just for this. Um, okay, so this is talking about Daniel when government becomes God and what's needed to pray for our nation. Um, Daniel was called to heal the history of his people, repairing the past to redeem the present and restore God's dream for the future. To accomplish this, history has to be healed. In other words, to bring the Jews back to the promised land. A stockpile of generational sins which defrauded God's people of their legitimacy before heaven's court and denied them access to their land of promise had to be dealt with. Daniel's intercession propelled him before heaven's court on their behalf. In time, not only were the Jews restored from exile, but King Cyrus even funded their journey home. As you know, he even provided restoration of their temple. The void of clear freedom or promise in an area of life is the clearest indicator there's a problem. And usually, the agony we suffer because of this void is what drives us to solutions. We often want to put a band-aid on a problem, but God desires to fix things at a foundational level. Uh, one of the meanings of the individual's name that gave me this word is light. When light touched the crack, everything exploded. Okay? As John the Baptist famously observed, the axe must be laid at the root of the tree. Do you discern a cyclical pattern of the same problems from uh, previous generations? History is on repeat. For his people to be restored from captivity, their own history had to be repaired. I think this is very interesting because you know what we're in right now. This year is the year of the 50th anniversary of Watergate. Okay. And then 50 years of fighting Roe versus Wade, so Watergate's 50. I wonder if one of the giants you see is institutional Christianity. I don't know. It's captured people, but they're on God's target, and uh, he's going to destroy it. So our... Because I think I, I just kept... It is more of a feeling than something I heard was the political correctness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's political correctness is definitely a giant. Well, and see the vitriol with which they went after President Trump because he was far, far, far from politically correct. Right. Right. You know, he'd say things we're thinking and we won't say because you just don't say them. And uh, but I feel for for okay. So if we look at Kings, although it was like running a marathon, you know, going through those books, there's a pattern and it's showing up in our country. And, but the church is in a pattern too. And we're in Babylon. And we've got to, okay, we're about to get where I wanna shut off the computer, but let me, or the phones, but let me take you to, like how many of you guys know your call, why you were born? Or you have an idea? Um, yeah. Okay. So usually, you know, you're kind of excited about your call. Well, years ago, when I was in my 20s, God said, this is your call. This is your lifetime call. I'm like, oh, good, good. What, what is it? He said, turn to Jew. Okay. Verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life, and have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. What? What? What are you talking about? Okay, so I think what I want to do, well, first of all, that word is where we're at now. Like, Roberta's, um, the word you had on the spirit of offense, right? Um, <laughs> quite frankly, there's just no more time for it. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I've had it up to here, actually, with it. But that word really impacted me because love is a response to offense. And, uh, and so one of the things that love helps you is it helps you to see those that are maybe kind of a little weak in their faith to help them, but others, they're dangerously close to judgment. Snatch them out, right? Like the boats. So we, we have um, 
an obligation to discern, okay, is this one that's just kind of questioning some things and we can help them with the word and prayer, or is this someone that is close to judgment because they're wearing garments of the flesh and we may, we can snatch them out, but don't, don't start participating in the flesh, right? So uh, that, I think, I, uh, will be the end of the public, and then I'm going to go into the, the private uh, matters if you want to shut everything down, Mikey.